Wow, what a great crowd. Thanks for coming out. When you were coming in, the young man who was helping to hand out programs was one of my former students. And he turned to me a few minutes ago and he said, that's a good crowd. Is it the topic or is it you? <laughs> I would like for him to believe that it's me. But I think we all know it's probably the topic. Civil War 150 years later continues to attract interest. Uh, although there are some people in the field who are becoming concerned that we're losing a generation who's more interested in other topics. Nonetheless, a crowd like this, I think, demonstrates something that a few of us have been saying for a long time, which is there's still interest in this period in American history if we cultivate it. Before I jump in, though, I do want to thank everybody here at Department of Archives and History for once again extending the welcome mat to me. I was out in the parking lot a while ago thinking to myself, trying to remember the first time that I came here. It was certainly long before I got the job at Auburn. I was teaching over in Georgia. I was doing research on a book. Uh, I was traveling across the South, going from state archive to state archive. Uh, looking for material on the Civil War Battle of Perryville up in Kentucky. And I showed up here unannounced. I didn't know anybody. Uh, and it was just a great experience. And I went home and told my wife what a nice place Montgomery is to do research. And I've come back here a lot of times since. I researched other books down the hall uh, when I was uh, vice president and president of the Alabama Historical Association. We had meetings here. Um, I have to say, I walked into this room and I remember the last time I was in here, it was for an AHA meeting. I don't remember the joke I told, but nobody liked it but me, so I sort of, <laughs> I sort of shuddered when I walked in today. It was like, ooh, I had forgotten that. <laughs> and this flag, Company B, 7th Alabama Cavalry, that's part of the wonderful flag collection that we have here at this archive. It's the state flag. It's a Confederate flag. Uh, I think it says a lot as a symbol. And that's how it ended up on the cover of the book that Sherry mentioned. The Yellowhammer War, that was almost the title I wanted. Um, if you've ever negotiated with the press, titles are very important to marketing departments. Uh, but that's close. The Civil War and Reconstruction in Alabama. This is not a book talk. I'm not here to get you to buy books. Uh, although if you'd like to, that would be fine. Uh, there, there are a few out in the lobby. But it does give me a place to jump off and talk about the larger topic for today. Um, back in 2008, I think, 2007 or 2008, when I was still vice president of the Alabama Historical Association, there were a few of us who noticed that the Civil War sesquicentennial was almost upon us. And it seemed that not a lot was happening. Not at the federal level, not at the state level, in some cases not at the local levels that we knew. And so Ann Feathers, who was president at the time, a dear friend of mine, a great president of AHA, put together a committee of some of us who work in the Civil War field, including Bob Bradley, who walks, works upstairs, and we started asking ourselves, what could we do so that there was something happening in the state in regards to the sesquicentennial? This was before we knew really anything about uh, the Becoming Alabama initiative, which of course has become the state's major initiative for all of the celebrations that we're having over these few years. So we put together this committee, and we exchanged emails, and we met sometimes. And we came up with ideas. We said, well, we could send out speakers. And we've done that. And we will continue to do that. Uh, you're all invited to a big one-day Civil War conference we're going to have down at Auburn in September. We could publish a special issue of the Alabama Review. And we did that. And I forget who first brought it up. I think it may have been me, actually. I said, you know, we could publish a book. We could publish a book about Alabama in the Civil War. 
and reconstruction, because the committee was very adamant, rightly so, we needed to look at reconstruction, not just the war. We could publish a book and give a sense of where we are right now. What does Alabama Civil War and Reconstruction history look like? Who's writing on this topic right now? We could bring all those people together in one volume. And people could have a sense of where we are and where we're going. And everybody thought that was a wonderful idea. And then we just waited for somebody to come forward and edit the book. And of course, nobody did. So somehow I ended up with it. And I was a little nervous about that. Uh, I'm from Virginia. I'm not from Alabama. Uh, I've learned a lot of Alabama history in the 14 years I've lived here. But I wasn't sure I was the right person to do it. But in the end, I did. In the end, I did. And we sent out a call and essentially said to people who are writing Alabama history, what would you like to contribute? I mean, the other approach would have been to say, well, we need a chapter about this and a chapter about this and a chapter about that. But I thought, no, let's see what Alabama Civil War history looks like as we approach the sesquicentennial. And I ended up writing an introduction. Now, in writing the introduction, I had to confront something else. It never really occurred to me when I started this project. But there's something about anniversaries. There's something about commemoration. There's something about getting together with the family every Thanksgiving or Christmas. Uh, I remember all those Christmases where all my family came together in Virginia. It's probably why I still have you know, traumatic feelings about Christmas. They'd, <laughs> they didn't always get along. Uh, and sometimes we don't always get along when we have these gatherings. But these big anniversaries, they make us stop and think. And as I was thinking about the sesquicentennial, I couldn't help but think back 50 years to the centennial of the American Civil War in the 1960s. And about how scholarship has changed, and as a country, how we've changed our attitudes toward that conflict in the last 50 years. And I will confess, I am old enough to sort of remember the last couple of years of the centennial. And for me, as a five, six-year-old child in Virginia, the centennial was a lot of fun. Up there, Upper left, that's from the 1962 Sears catalog. <laughs> 50 years from now, people will ask, what was the Sears catalog? <laughs> Those of you who are my age will remember the joy you experienced when the Christmas catalog started to arrive, right? You're all nodding your heads. I never got the uniform. I got the hat. I got the gun. I got a rifle at some point. Actually, I think I got a couple of caps. But in the Sears catalog, you could buy child-sized uniforms or Southern Belle dresses for the young ladies. And in the same Sears catalog, you could buy all sorts of things, games and forts and more weapons and a lot of kitsch and a lot of fun stuff. The trading cards, that's actually from a Topps trading card set, the same people who had the monopoly on baseball cards in the 1960s. That's from the Civil War trading card set. Federal government got involved in all sorts of ways, including stamps. And then there were visits to battlefields, which exploded in numbers in the late 50s and into the 60s. in part because the centennial gave birth to something we now know as Civil War reenactment. People went to battlefields. This is first Manassas. First battlefield I ever went to, I think I was six. I remember the day very well. My parents and my grandparents took me. I climbed around on cannons. I ran around on the field. And at some point, my father put me up here on the Stonewall Jackson statue. Uh, you can't really tell. It's, this, in Virginia, we call this Stonewall on steroids, he's kind of distorted. Uh, but I'm sure the rangers were just freaking out because this little boy was up on top of Stonewall Jackson. And I think about that every time I go back there. 
for me, the centennial was a lot of fun as a child. And I think that's true for a lot of historians of my generation. I gave a paper ago at one of the major conferences, and whatever we were talking about, battle history. How do you write battle history? And there was a gentleman in the crowd, and during the question and answer session, he raised his hand and he said, how did all of you get involved in Civil War history? Where does your interest in the Civil War come from? And we went down the stage, and every last one of us said for us it started out with the centennial. These are the same historians, in many cases, 50 years later, who are giving speeches and writing articles about how the sesquicentennial has failed. Because we don't have any of this, or much of this. Because we're measuring the current event by all that fun stuff we remembered when we were kids. In fact, the centennial was a lot more problematic. It was a lot stickier and complicated than us five and six year olds remember. So here are some basic facts about the centennial 50 years ago. 1957, same year I was born, uh, President Dwight Eisenhower signed into law a bill that had been making its way through Congress for a while, which created the United States Civil War Centennial Commission. This was going to be an event that was supervised and funded by a federal agency. Almost immediately, and in fact, some of these debates had been going on during the legislative process. Arguments began among different groups who wanted to shape and really control the centennial. In the beginning, there were a couple of different vying groups. On the one hand, you had a guy named Carl Betts, who was very active in the, in the Washington, I think, Civil War Roundtable. And what he envisioned was what the historian Robert Cook has called a Cold War pageant. That America was going to pull out the stops and demonstrate our unity and our superiority against communism by demonstrating how far we had come since our own fratricidal war. What he envisioned was a lot of hoopla, parades and pageants, television programs, stuff in the Sears catalog, a lot of excitement that people could take part of. Average people could get involved in celebrating the centennial, and buy things. <laughs> Buying things was always part of it. At the other end of the debate were the people like me, the college professors, and some fairly important Civil War historians, like Bell Wiley over at Emory University, who wrote the classic books Life of Johnny Reb and Life of Billy Yank, were just appalled by this notion that we were going to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Civil War with this big, showy party. Uh, if you've ever read Bell Wiley, I don't know, how many of y'all have read Bell Wiley? Very good, a few of you have, more of you should. Those books were written in the late 40s and 50s and they're still marvelous. They're the beginnings of our attempts to understand what Civil War soldiers were thinking, their motivation, what they were fighting for. Bill Wiley had spent years reading letters and diaries from soldiers. And he had come to the conclusion that the Civil War was not much fun. Not for the men who fought it. 
Not for the men who were away from home, the men who were wounded, the men sleeping out in the mud, the men going into battle. It did not strike him as something that should be trivialized, he would say, with a lot of fanfare and hoopla and a circus-like atmosphere. Wiley and other historians argued for a different kind of centennial, one that would emphasize quieter remembrance. Speeches, like this one. Trying to go out and find documents that families still had, getting them published, those letters, those diaries, getting them into circulation where other people could use them. The publication of new books based on those materials. Wiley was concerned that Civil War history was getting a little stale. It wasn't telling a completely honest story. He wanted to use the centennial to sort of stimulate a whole new generation of scholars. At least at first, the historians lost. People wanted the fun stuff. And so as the centennial moved forward, the emphasis was going to be on pageantry. And they literally brought in people who ran beauty pageants and the like to set up some of these early observances. Now, guess what? The first great event in the Civil War centennial occurred, where else? Right here, in Montgomery. In February 1961, to mark the creation of the Confederacy and Jefferson Davis's inauguration as president. Alabama got moving on that as early as 1959. Governor John Patterson was very adamant that Alabama had to be involved 100% in the centennial. As were a lot of other southern governors, in part because the war was largely fought in the south, in part because they anticipated tourist dollars coming in from elsewhere in the country, but in part because folks like Governor Patterson were hoping to use the centennial for something else. We all know what else was happening in Alabama and elsewhere in the south in the late 1950s and early 1960s. And Patterson and those who supported him Historian Albert B. Moore up at Tuscaloosa were very adamant that they saw the centennial as a way, another way, to defend states' rights and segregation. So the state of Alabama pulled out the stops in the late 50s and early 60s. The commission to oversee the state centennial included the governor, Lieutenant Governor, uh, Speaker of the House, chairs of the History Department from Auburn and the other state institution, the other big state institution. <laughs> <laughs> kick, Nick, kick. Um, I'm sorry. I'm still happy. You know, turn half the audience against me. Lots of people. Uh, UDC was involved, Sons of Confederate Veterans were involved, all sorts of other groups were involved, Chamber of Commerce was involved, huge committee, because this was going to be the first, and it really needed to be great. So they spent years building up to that week in February 1961. And I'm curious, I've been thinking about this all day. How many of you remember, do any of you remember, the centennial observances here in Montgomery in 61? Anybody? A few of you do. A few of you do. That's great. I think we'll have time left. I know because they're taping this, because they're taping this, uh, they want, uh, folks here want you to ask questions and make comments using microphones. I'd love to hear some of those stories. I really would. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong about anything. What happened was just this massive outpouring of interest. 
It has been estimated that 50,000 people took part in the centennial observance in Montgomery. There was a huge pageant at the Coliseum with music and dancing and dramatic readings, the height of which was when they reenacted the inauguration of Jefferson Davis. There was a torchlight parade in which a local attorney who was playing the role of Jefferson Davis actually arrived in town on a train and they, they took him to the hotel just as they had taken the real Jefferson Davis. There was a huge parade down Dexter Avenue and then finally the reenactment of the Davis inauguration. And most folks who were in power in Montgomery said the whole thing had been great. And the Civil War Centennial Commission thought it had been a great success. There were some murmurings, however. It had been noticed that uh, Montgomery's black community had largely not participated. They were interested in other things and actually were often critical of this celebration of the Civil War, the Confederate uniforms, the flags. But it must have been a sight to see. Men had been growing mustaches and beards, kids. Maybe some of y'all were allowed to go to school once a week in costume. I mean, I think there's a great oral history project to be done. Because no one has ever interviewed any of y'all who took part in this. I think it would be marvelous. The centennial seemed to be off to a pretty good start. But that didn't last very long. Those of you who understand the Civil War know, if this was the first great moment to mark the creation of the Confederacy in February of 61, what was the obvious next big celebration? Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter, April 61, yes sir. And again, Charleston had planned this huge affair, this huge event to mark Fort Sumter. And the entire Civil War Commission arrived in Charleston to watch and to take part, including the New Jersey delegation, which contained an African-American member. And when they arrived at the Francis Marion Hotel in Charleston, she was told she could not stay with the others. The New Jersey delegation and delegations from several other northern states threatened to leave if she was not allowed in the hotel. Phone calls were made, increasing panic ensued. Eventually somebody got President John Kennedy on the phone. And John Kennedy moved the entire meeting to the Charleston Navy Yard, integrated federal property. Except those southern members from some states who decided that they would secede from the Civil War Centennial Commission. <laughs> That's kind of marking it. Uh, and held their own meeting at the Francis Marion Hotel where they enunciated some of those themes that had been fairly muted about race and integration. And at that moment, what we don't remember, those of us who remember the centennial, we missed this, I think. The whole thing nearly fell apart. Eventually, in an effort to save the event, John Kennedy fired the people in charge and replaced them with, guess who? The historians, the history professors, who finally had a chance, after the whole thing had started, to develop their version of the centennial. Of course, a lot of the events were already scheduled. But now you start to see much greater emphasis on publication and speeches and let's find those documents and let's get them microfilmed and let's find out where they are. And the whole event sort of shifted even as I was looking at my Sears catalog dreaming about the next Civil War item I could buy, uh, the centennial changed. It changed in other ways too. Uh, not everybody was happy about this shift toward a more academic centennial. Uh, no one more so than the next governor of Alabama, George Wallace. Wallace was elected at the end of 1962, and as he pointed out frequently during the campaign, he was very interested in the Civil War centennial. His great-grandfather had died on Lookout Mountain. And so when Governor Wallace took over, um, 
there was a full embrace of Confederate symbolism. He, of course, gave his famous segregation, now segregation forever speech, standing exactly on the spot where Jefferson Davis had taken the inaugural oath. Uh, that's when the flag went up on the State House. That's when the flag went on the State Trooper cars. Uh, there was a lot of symbolism. And then finally, in July 1963, what was going to be the biggest event of the centennial, George Wallace went to Gettysburg and gave a speech on July 2nd. Those Alabamians who had gone up Little Round Top. What he basically argued was that his policies were no different than what they were fighting for. And according to everybody, he was at Gettysburg in 1963, he got the biggest crowd and the loudest applause, especially from the new reenacting community. And after this, a lot of northern states just said, we're done. The centennial lived out the rest of its years, seemingly pretty quietly. Events were canceled, or people quit showing up, and that was sort of the end of it. Except, except, the books started coming. In fairness, the books had been coming since the late 50s. Publishers sensed that there might be a market for the Civil War, and so people started writing. And with the change, of course, in the centennial, there was even more of an emphasis on this, especially coming from the new leaders, Alan Nevins, who was at the time a very well-known Civil War historian, and one of my former professors, James Robertson, Bud Robertson at Virginia Tech, who for years, some of you all may have heard Dr. Robinson, he used to come down to uh, Montgomery every two years and give a talk um, at the Virginia Tech Athletic Association, um, most recently over at First Baptist. The books started coming. I would argue, and people might disagree with me, but I would argue that the greatest book about the Civil War in Alabama, to come out of the centennial, was this one. It's Malcolm McMillan's Alabama Confederate Reader. It's still a darn good book. It's a collection of speeches and documents. It's, uh, it's a book of primary sources that this Auburn University professor put together as his contribution to the centennial. And I've used it time and time again over the years. It is interesting to look at the book now. It is almost entirely concerned with politics and military affairs, what we famously call battles and leaders. But that said, it's a good book. Now, some people are critical of what they call centennialism. Centennial history. They argue that it all sort of sounds alike. Uh, it was very reconciliationist. That is to say, there wasn't a lot of emphasis on what the war was about, what caused it, or the results. It was very much on the battlefield. Here's what happened between, in those war years. Everybody was brave. Everybody was good. Both sides were right. Abraham Lincoln was great. That's also another part of centennialism that annoys some people. It's very much the sort of Civil War history you might expect to come out in the middle of the Cold War. Because I will tell you this, Civil War history generally reflects the times in which it is written. The disillusionment after World War I created a generation of people who thought the war should have been avoided. World War II and the Cold War produced a notion of a good war, another greatest generation. Uh, Vietnam changed everything. There was a lot more interest in common soldiers, dissent. Um, what about women, African Americans, people who had been ignored up through the centennial largely. We're seeing another one of the sea changes right now. I see it every year as new books come out. I'm on a couple of book prize committees. I'm reading a lot of new books about the Civil War. It's changing. We have entered some sort of, some sort of period, I think, marked by our continuing wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Civil War history is changing again. The centennial, if nothing else, produced a lot of important literature. So what about the sesquicentennial? How about now? We do not have the federal government involved at all. We do not have the president or Congress passing legislation or sending money to states to celebrate and mark the Civil War. Uh, 
In Alabama, we are lucky to at least have the Becoming Alabama initiative, which of course is marking all three of these events together since they overlap. Some states don't have anything like this at all. This speech is actually uh, part of the Becoming Alabama series. But as I said, we have historians now, we have general people. Y'all may agree with this. Feel free to do so. You think that the sesquicentennial has been a bust. I don't know. I tend to be one of those half glass empty people anyway, half empty glass people, but I'm not willing to give up on the sesquicentennial yet because I do see a lot of events happening, the state level, locally. Uh, my classes are always full. You're always here. Look at you. Beyond that, 50 years ago, they had no internet. And I see a lot on the net every day of people marking the Civil War. Literally, what happened 150 years ago today? Arguing about stuff, getting mad at each other. It's pretty ugly sometimes. It's pretty enlightening sometimes. I mean, that's going on as well. And that's sort of the climate that I think produced the scholarship in this book. Malcolm McMillan's Alabama Confederate Reader was largely, almost exclusively, about battles and leaders. Remember what I said a few minutes ago. I wanted to see what people were doing. I basically just contacted a lot of people and said, you write about Alabama and the Civil War Reconstruction. What are you working on now? What would you like to contribute? And the end result is a different looking book of essays by different people. There are chapters on politics. Very interesting revisionist take on William Lowndes Yancey and the breakup of the Democratic Party. Uh, there are chapters on military history. Uh, Brian Wills about Selma. Um, Ben Severance, who teaches at AUM, a wonderful chapter on the Battle of Salem Church, which was part of the Chancellorsville campaign. Ben actually argues that that's the great moment of Alabama in the Civil War, which is an interesting argument. And he sort of backs it up. I think he very much backs it up, actually. But a lot of this book is also about topics that they weren't thinking of back in the centennial. There are chapters on women's role in secession. There are chapters on common soldiers and what they fought for. There's a chapter on how Alabamians black and white reacted to the assassination of Lincoln. And there are chapters on Reconstruction. There are chapters on white unionists. There's a chapter on Wager Swain and the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, there's a chapter on how the black church grew up during Reconstruction. Uh, these are things that they weren't thinking about in the centennial. People ask me where we're going. Where are we going in Civil War history? Where are we going in Alabama Civil War history? And I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. And I do think that the questions we ask are often influenced by our own lives and what's happening in our own world. After years of hearing stories about post-traumatic stress, is it any surprise that we suddenly have Civil War historians trying to write about post-traumatic stress or suicide uh, when we have so many, um, we have such a high rate of suicide now in the military? These questions influence people. Where are we going? I, I think there's still going to be good political history written, and there's some that should be written. We still need really good studies of Alabama Civil War governors. Uh, I think we still need a lot of good military history. We need a really, really good study of Blakely and Spanish Fort. I keep hoping somebody will write that. Uh, but we're also going to see continuing interest in the social history of the war, in civilians. We desperately, desperately need more work on African Americans during the war in Alabama. That was the one chapter I did try to track down, and eventually I couldn't find anybody to write it. But it should be in there. We need that work. And memory. Why do we remember the war the way we do? Why do we mark it? Why do we do this? Why do we not do that? There are studies that deal with these questions in other states, but I think we need those studies here in Alabama. I don't know what Civil War history will look like in 50 years. And in a way, that's OK. I'll be dead. 
in 50 years, I assume, unless there are great medical breakthroughs in the next 50 years. But we're going to be celebrating a bicentennial of the Civil War. Will these trends continue? Will events reverse trends? Will new topics pop up? I don't know. I don't know. I won't try to predict. But we've certainly seen a great difference between the centennial and the sesquicentennial. And I think we're starting to see a real difference between centennial scholarship and sesquicentennial scholarship. Before we pronounce the sesquicentennial dead, let's wait a few years and see what those books look like and what those speeches sound like. And then I think we can adequately judge how effective this commemoration was. To keep getting at the true events of the war, uh, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. And if the book we put together contributes to that in any way, if it somehow comes even close to standing the test of time of books that came out of the centennial like Malcolm McMillan's, I think we'll have to count that as success. So if you have questions, I think you'll need microphones here in a few minutes. If you have memories of the centennial here in 61, I, I would love to hear them. Um, but feel free to ask me anything you'd like to ask, and I'll try to answer any questions you might have. Yes? Thank you. Uh, first, let me make this announcement. Uh, Georgia Ann and I have handheld microphones, and we would like you to raise your hand and let us get a microphone to you and for you to speak directly into the microphone so that it can be recorded and the uh, attendees in the overflow room can hear your question. where there was a prisoner of war camp. And I'm always struck that um, during this anniversary, we see a lot of descendants that are tracing their ancestors' mm -hmm. footprints, and they're particularly interested in where they're kept as prisoners of war. And then in the documents, you see that the veterans themselves, after the war, associated in groups of other prisoners of war. But, um, if you deal with the Civil War Trust or the Battlefield Protection, there does seem to be very little interest. Like it ends with the battle. And so, since you're talking about the context of things, mm -hmm. why do you think that is? That that part is not valued as much as it is by the families and by the veterans themselves? I want to answer that question two ways. I think part of it is that we get into habits, we get into patterns. We write history because that's the way we've always, always written Civil War history. And battle narratives tends to stop when the armies march away. Now, there are a few of us. When I wrote about Perryville, I didn't like that approach at all. So I actually pushed that narrative through, really to the present. I talked about the formation of the battlefield. I talked about what happened to a lot of the veterans and the families of those who were killed. But part of it is just inertia. The Civil War generation themselves established a pattern, almost a formula, of how you write Civil War history. And we basically, we've kept doing that. That's part of it. The other part of the question is that prisoner of war camps are pretty awful. And if you're going to spend three or four or five years working on a topic, very often that's not something you want to do. The exception is Andersonville. For lots of reasons, I think, going back to a lot of angry Union veterans who made an issue of Andersonville right after the war, you know, we've always had books on Andersonville. There are always people writing about Andersonville and going to Andersonville. But there's been remarkably little scholarship about the prisoner of war experience in general. There have been a few good books of late. But by and large, it's something, yes, that we have ignored, and I think wrongly so. To my mind, I mean, there's, there's an older, fairly decent account of Cahaba. But most people in Alabama don't know that there was a prisoner of war camp at Cahaba. We could study that. There's a lot, of, I think, that could be done. Those poor men who ended up going home only to be blown up and killed on a steamboat at the end of the war. It's one of the saddest stories of the war. Um, we just need to encourage those kinds of topics. Why? I think because it just isn't as much fun. Nobody wants to get in their Sears catalog and find a tattered uniform of what some poor prisoner would have looked like. 
And I say that as somebody of my five Civil War ancestors, all of whom were Confederate cavalrymen, of five ancestors, three of them ended up in Union prisoner of war camps. So it's certainly something that I've noticed as well. Three in prisoner of war camps, uh, one who took the oath, he was 16. And one who just sort of disappeared until the war was over and popped up one day and said, I'm home. <laughs> They'd sent him off with the horses. <laughs> he kept going. <laughs> well, no, you can't reenact. No, it's, it's, it's memory. I mentioned memory. We remember elements we want to remember, and we don't remember elements we don't want to remember. And that's true of every generation since the 60s, I think. We have a question. Yes, sir. Well, in 2011, there was another reenactment of Jefferson Davis and Auburn, mm -hmm. right up Extra Avenue, all the Confederate yeah. flags and everything. Yeah. Um, and it's in my notes, and I should have mentioned it, and I forgot. And I wasn't there. Maybe some of y'all were there. I read in the paper, correct me if I'm wrong, I read in the paper that there were a few hundred people. Now, maybe that's an exaggeration, but I read there were a few hundred people as opposed to 50,000. It was a much smaller event. And I think that says something as well. It was not a, an event that was supported by the governor or the state government or the legislature. It basically was heritage groups that put that together. I'm not quite sure what the city expected. Uh, one of my former students who teaches at Troy Montgomery was interviewed during that parade by a British war correspondent. <laughs> that the BBC had sent to cover, I don't know what they had sent him to cover. I'm not sure what they expected to happen on Dexter Avenue, but uh, yeah, but it's much smaller, and I think all of the events, and I'm, I'm glad you reminded me of this, I just forgot about it. I think all of the events that began right at the beginning of the sesquicentennial turned out to be much smaller than people hoped for. And there was a question, was that because of support? Was it advertising? Has the American public just generally lost interest? Uh, I'm not sure we know at this point. But yes, there absolutely was. And if you compare the two, I think that alone tells you something. Like I said, if I'm wrong about the numbers, correct me. That's just what I read in the advertiser. We have a question here. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, I was just doing the research and looking back at 1961. Did you go back and look at 1911? That's a good question. I've studied 1911 uh, a little bit. I actually teach a course uh, at Auburn on Civil War memory. One of my star students here in the front I'll let you answer this question. Um, 1911 was interesting. 1911 was one of those events that centered at Gettysburg. There were still a lot of veterans alive in 1911 who gathered at various battlefields. They especially went to Pennsylvania, but they were everywhere else, too. Uh, what's, what's notable about 1911, and what we tend to remember about 1911, is that while the federal government was not sponsoring events, the federal government was involved. Woodrow Wilson famously gave a speech uh, at Gettysburg in 1913, in which he basically said, I grew up in the South. I remember Confederate Army marching down the street. Sure, I'm glad we lost because we have one united country and let's forge ahead into the 20th century. We don't have a really good study of 1911. We've got one book about the centennial. It's a good book, I think, but we could use more. Um, but in terms of 1911, I actually have my students read the uh, Wilson speech. And I, then I ask them, what's he saying? What's going on here? A lot of people mark that moment as a real transition period from the years in which veterans were telling the story to the years that the sons and daughters of veterans started telling the story more and more. And it's, it's, it's messy. It's not as neat as that. Uh, and I'm, I'm talking too much. 1911 would be a really good topic. I know a little bit about it. Somebody over here, I think. Yes, sir. Um, thank you for your... Um you talk of, is, uh, is part of the reason that the celebration here was smaller is that media and political correctness have made Southerners uh, almost shameful, that, that um, 
if you celebrate the Civil War or your ancestors' participation in it, you, you participate in a, in a reenactment somehow that's uh, modern day racism, you're celebrating things that were wrong and terrible, it's best just to be quiet and go home and, and don't admit that you admire the, the history and courage and, and the positive things that came out of that. Do you see that as being part of the reason it was less of a celebration? And do you feel that as a, 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 an ancestor, about your ancestors? I think, I think there were certainly people who were making that argument. Anybody who celebrates the Civil War, especially anybody who marks or says anything good about the Confederacy, um, they're not very nice people. You think about what John Stewart did after the big secession ball. John Stewart on The Daily Show uh, spent days making fun of people who had attended a secession ball uh, in 2010 in Charleston. I think that's part of it. I think there are bigger issues. I think the lack of government involvement is probably both good and bad. On the one hand, I don't want the government telling me what to think about the Civil War or how to celebrate it. But on the other hand, we can't escape the fact that in the 60s you had this massive federal umbrella organization that was organizing a lot of things, and you had state organizations north and south that were organizing those things. And basically now anybody who wants to do anything has been left to their own devices. So it's that the lack of the engine, it's almost like trying to push the car without the motor, that I think is the driving force. But that said, I don't think we can underestimate the fact that from 1961 to 2011, a lot of Americans are thinking different things about slavery, race, the Civil War, the Confederacy. And I think for a lot of state governments and a lot of people, it's just easier to stay away from it. I mean, it just is. Wherever I go, you guys have been great today, but very often when I give speeches, people just want to yell at me. <laughs> Whatever I say, it's that controversial. Isn't it easy to avoid controversy? I can't get away with it, but. I have a question. Uh, who's next? Uh, right here. Okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I think that to some extent, when I think about these anniversaries and remembering, maybe more commemoration or remembrance resonates more than celebration, mm -hmm. and that is that, that it should be a time for reflection, and it may be that some of the work that's being done now is more reflective than celebratory. And I think even for my daughter's generation, it would be very important on these anniversaries to talk about how what we are living currently in a city like Montgomery or a state like Alabama, where I did not grow up, um, what are the threads or the um, attitudes, relationships, the social <coughs> interactions, the politics, et cetera, that grew out of the Civil War and helping us to understand how that actually, down through 150 years, has affected our lives and affects them today. And that would be a wonderful part of the remembrance that you know we still have ongoing, you know, through 19 or 2014. I think in some ways, I think in some ways you've described the original argument in the centennial better than I did. I mean, there was a lot of argument about whether this was a celebration or a commemoration. A celebration is one thing. A celebration is, hey, weren't we great? Or, hey, weren't we right? Or, hey, weren't we something? A commemoration is a moment to stop and think, what happened? And why did this happen? What does it matter? And what have we learned? And where are we going? And how's it, how does it still affect us? Because it does. Um, and, you know, some of y'all are welcome to agree and some of y'all are welcome to disagree. I like open debate in my classes. I'm firmly on team historian. I'm, I'm very much a part of let's commemorate, let's think about, let's try to understand, um, and 
I mean, that was, that was the whole idea of this. That's the whole idea of the book, to try to start some of those discussions. That doesn't mean that people who want to celebrate are wrong or that you shouldn't. I mean, you're more than welcome to. We all mark important events in our lives in different ways. It's like when I married my wife and discovered all sorts of different ways to celebrate Christmas because she comes from a German-American family and things are different and you eat different things and one's not better than the other. I, I know what I'm comfortable with. I know what I think we should do because I deal with students every day. I deal with young people who are gonna grow up and be parents and teachers and, and business people and political leaders. And I think it's important that they have an honest conversation about the war and its legacy. Uh, the good stuff and the bad stuff. Not just the part we want to remember, but the parts we ought to remember. So I would agree with you. We have time for one more question. Right here on the front right. Yes, sir. I must say I enjoyed your talk today. Thank you. But I think what we're talking about is a, is a uh, lack of history being taught, not only of the Confederacy and the Civil War or the War for Southern Independence, as I'd rather prefer to be called, but we're seeing the death of history teaching because for whatever reason, and it's the, Dr. George Petrie at Auburn University said that was the toughest subject to teach was history because you're talking about dead people. Mm -hmm. And it's not very interesting unless you can find some way to bring it to life. But I'll give you an example. Of, I, I asked a high school senior last week who Robert E. Lee was. And she says, wasn't he a president? Well, we just don't have history being taught, so we don't have, we can't have remembrances and celebrations and we don't have history being taught. People don't have an appreciation for history. Yeah. And they should because if we don't, if we don't learn it, we'll repeat the, the same mistakes over and over again like we've been doing since time began. Yeah, I told my classes this week that they have map quizzes, in part because when I was teaching in Georgia, I had too many students who couldn't find Georgia on a map. Uh, I have a friend who teaches in textile engineering at Auburn, but he's also a Civil War enactor. He's with a local 33rd group. And he does a poll with his students every year, name the date that the Civil War began. I think half of them managed to get the right century. <laughs> so yes, before we start talking about the nuances of history, Maybe we ought to think about how we're teaching the basics in the lower levels. And I say that as somebody who very much supports public school teachers who generally want to teach that history, but you run into lesson plans and, and this, that, and the other, and all the things that public school teachers have to deal with, social studies instead of history. Um, yeah, we have issues there. We absolutely do. Thank you so much, Dr.